With permission, I'd like to make a statement on the operation of the Seoul Convention and its application to the European Union Withdrawal Bill in relation to Scotland. Mr Speaker, these are serious times and serious issues, and I've come to this House today with respect and ready for constructive debate, and I hope that that is the spirit on all sides. Lord Sewell set out a commitment in 1998 that there should be a parliamentary convention to recognise that where the UK Parliament legislated in a devolved area, it would, and I quote, not normally legislate without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Throughout the passage of this bill, the Government has demonstrated its commitment to the Sewell Convention and the principles that underpin our Constitution. We have followed the spirit and the letter of the devolution settlement at every stage. The EU Withdrawal Bill is about ensuring that the whole of the United Kingdom has a functioning statute book on exit day. It is about providing legal certainty to businesses and individuals up and down the country. From the outset, we have been clear that as a result of the, EU, uh, the UK's exit, we would expect to see a significant increase in decision-making powers of the devolved institutions. We have been clear that exit would provide the opportunity to bring powers home from Brussels, not just to the UK Parliament, but to all legislatures of the United Kingdom. We must remember that the powers in question were handed to the European Union through our membership in 1972 long before devolution existed in Scotland. Exit was neither anticipated nor provided for within the Scotland Act and the structure of the devolution settlement. So it is clearly fair to say, as Mike Russell, the Scottish Government's own Brexit Minister, has said, these are not normal times. Nevertheless, we have sought to respect the devolution settlements at every turn and recognise the strength of feeling across this House as well as within the devolved administrations, that the original measures set out in the Bill did not meet aspirations. No one could deny that this Government has come a long way from that original position. Discussions have been conducted at multilateral level through the JMCEN and the JMCP, chaired by the Prime Minister, bilaterally between administrations and extensive official level engagement and we have made significant changes to the Bill. These changes enabled the Welsh Labour Government to support the agreement and to gain the approval of the other place and this House. And these changes have seen the original clause turned on its head. Now, all decision-making powers returning from the EU that intersect with devolved competence will pass directly to Cardiff, Edinburgh and Belfast, unless explicit steps are taken to temporarily preserve an existing EU framework. The intergovernmental agreement underpinning the new clause set out how those steps should be taken, with an emphasis on collaboration and agreement. Together, this means we are emphatically delivering on our commitment to give significant further powers to the Scottish Parliament. The clause also provides, in certain limited cases, the current arrangements we have under the EU will remain until we have implemented our new UK-wide frameworks. I want to stress that we have already agreed with the Scottish and Welsh governments where this temporary preservation needs to be considered. The governments are agreed that freezing areas is likely to be in just 24 of the 153 areas of power returning to the UK from the EU. And to anyone who has sought to present this as seeking to take powers back from the Scottish Parliament, I repeat here that this bill includes a specific provision that makes clear explicitly that no decision-making powers currently exercised by the Scottish Parliament can be taken away. These amendments strike the right balance between ensuring exit results in increased decision-making powers for the devolved legislatures while continuing to provide certainty about how our laws will operate and protecting our UK internal market, a market so vital for Scotland's businesses. These amendments do not and cannot go as far as the Scottish Government want. 
because the Scottish Government want a veto over arrangements that will apply to the whole of the UK. But as Lord Wallace, the former Deputy First Minister of Scotland, set out when this bill was being debated in the other place, this was not part of the original devolution settlement. Our approach also helps to ensure the continued integrity of that UK market, which I have said is so vital for the people and businesses of Scotland. At every stage, the SNP has disregarded the need to preserve this market and ensure that there are no new barriers to working or doing business in the UK. The UK internal market is worth over four times more to businesses in Scotland than EU trade, and we must make sure it is preserved as we leave the EU. We have reached a point now where, as the Welsh Labour Government have clearly stated, these arrangements reflect and respect how the devolution settlements operate. The devolved legislators will have a formal role in considering where existing frameworks need to be temporarily preserved. This is what we have delivered. However, Scotland has two democratically elected parliaments, and it is only this parliament, the UK parliament, that can speak for the UK as a whole. It, it is deeply regrettable that Nicola Sturgeon's SNP Scottish Government was unable to sign up to the compromise solution brokered by officials from all the administrations working together. But, Mr Speaker, as we all know, you can only reach agreement in a negotiation if both sides actually want to reach agreement. The Scottish Government's position from the outset was that they would be content with nothing less than a veto. However, such an unreasonable position would fundamentally undermine the integrity of the UK internal market. This would harm business in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Despite the numerous attempts to find compromise and the fact that one was reached with the Welsh Labour Government, the SNP position has not changed. As a result, this Government, which represents the whole of the UK, could not responsibly accept their position. We are now faced with the reality that the Scottish Parliament has not given consent for this critically important legislation that provides certainty across the UK. That is not a situation that any of us would have chosen. It is not, however, a crisis, nor is it unforeseen. Whilst devolution settlements did not predict EU exit, they did explicitly provide that in situations of disagreement, the UK Parliament may be required to legislate without the consent of devolved legislatures. In any situation, agreement is our aim, and we will continue to seek legislative consent, take on board views, and to work with the Scottish Government on future legislation, just as we have always done. Mr Speaker, we on this side of the House have compromised. We have made every effort to reach agreement. We have sought consent. Now we are legislating in line with the Seoul Convention to ensure the whole of the United Kingdom leaves the EU with as much legal certainty as possible. That is what people and businesses in Scotland need. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. You know, Good to be back. I have to say to the Secretary of State for Scotland, is that all you have got? Yeah. Yep. Is that the best you can do? I mean, these are very serious times for Scotland. And I, I should thank the right honourable member for advance sight of his statement, but I'm deeply, deeply disappointed by its content. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, my very quick take on paragraph 24 of the Secretary of State's statement is it's a wholly new interpretation and indeed inversion of the constitutional arrangements. Yeah. Well, Section 28.7 of the Scotland Act confirms that Westminster retains its unlimited sovereignty, and arguably it can never relinquish that, the devolution and settlement provides through the Seoul Convention that the legislative power will not be used if there is a disagreement and the devolved legislators yep. do not yep. give 
consent. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 24 effectively turns Sewell on its head ah. and says that if there is disagreement, i.e. no consent on a legislative consent motion, that the UK Government can proceed to legislate. Yeah. This is an extremely serious development in UK Government thinking that risks the security of the devolution settlement. It also gives lie to the assertion in paragraph 26 that UK Government is legislating in line with the Sewell Convention. By its own admission in paragraph 24, it is doing the opposite. Yep. And perhaps the Secretary of State can give us clarity on what is happening here. The Sewell Convention, Mr Speaker, is clear. The UK Government should not legislate on devolved matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Sure. Well, Mr yeah, Speaker, yeah. the Scottish Parliament denied that consent, not the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Scottish National Party, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens. Yeah. We have all said that we do not give consent to what the UK Government is seeking to do. Yet the Secretary of State comes before us today with excuses, attempting to save his own skin, yeah. knowing that he has totally shafted Scotland and the people of Scotland. Yeah, 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 yeah. Empty excuses are clearly all he has, having utterly yeah. failed in his yeah. role as Secretary of State to protect our devolution settlement and to stand up for Scotland, what he should be doing. Aye, aye. He promised Jeez. that Scotland's Parliament would be become the most powerful devolved Parliament in the world. Wrong. He promised us in common stages that when the bill came back from the Lords, there would be time to debate Clause 11. Wrong. He told us that there would be a powers bonanza for the Scottish Parliament. Wrong. Wrong. Even in June 2016, he pledged to protect Scotland's place in the single market. Wrong. Wrong. Indeed, the Secretary of State for Scotland has downgraded. Do you find this in music? Keep it up, keep it up, that's good. Uh, order, order. The Right Honourable Gentleman must be able to complete his contribution. Yes, really. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, what was that? Somebody chanted from a secondary position? Surely not. Well, no, he will be enabled to complete his contribution. Mr. Ian Blackford. I, uh, you know, I would simply say to honourable and right honourable members opposite that the UK government's own analysis has indicated that a hard Brexit is going to damage jobs. And what do we see? What do we see? We see Conservative members of Parliament laughing. Yeah. Yeah. Laughing at the hardships that people Every of Scotland of might you. face. Every Mr Speaker, the Secretary Shame of State for Scotland has downgraded devolution, ignored the Scottish Parliament and silenced Scotland when he supported the withdrawal bill despite our Parliament, his Parliament, rejecting it. Will the Secretary of State now apologise to the people of Scotland yeah, yeah. for his series his series of broken promises. Yeah, yeah. The Secretary of State has failed to protect devolution. He has failed to protect the Scottish Parliament. He has failed to protect Scottish interests. Having plunged Scotland into constitutional crisis, will he finally do the right thing? If he has any dignity, if he has any self-respect, resign and do it now. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, the members mustn't become overexcited. We've got a long way to go. There's a lot still to be done. Lots of questions to be asked. Lots of debate to be had. Lots of fun to be savoured in a seemly manner. I feel sure. Secretary of State, Mr. Speaker. After yesterday, I'm not taking any lessons from the right honourable gentleman yeah. on dignity. Yeah. But we do also ha have a. At least we've had some clarification of what guerrilla tactics are going to be in this Parliament, chanting uh, in uh, line uh, with uh, what the Right Honourable Gentleman says. Now, I actually respect the fact that the Right Honourable Gentleman opposes Brexit. 
He is perfectly entitled to do that, but uh, he is not entitled, firstly, to ignore the views of over a million people in Scotland who voted for uh, Brexit, who uh, the SNP want to airbrush out of history, and he's not entitled to ignore the result of the referendum across the United Kingdom as a whole. And therefore, it is incumbent on this government to deliver Brexit, and that is what uh, we will do. I am hoping that it wasn't a willful misinterpretation of the Sewell uh, Convention that the Right Honourable Gentleman set out, because the Sewell Convention is not absolute. He set it out as if it was. It is not. As I set out in my statement, the, the situation is that uh, the government will seek, uh, uh, will seek consent unless uh, there are not normal circumstances applying. I think anyone would accept that the UK leaving the EU are not normal circumstances. Pete Wishart. There was only really one thing we needed to hear from the Secretary of State today, and I say this as somebody who is very fond of the Right Honourable Gentleman, and that was his resignation. He has presided over this crisis with an ineptness rarely demonstrated on something that required a delicate touch and a real negotiating skill, and he's done that with a litany of failed commitments and broken promises. He will be remembered as the Secretary of State who first reversed devolution. He has let our Parliament down, and he has let democracy down. For goodness sake, man, just go. Uh, well, that was an uncharacteristically quiet performance from uh, the right honourable gentleman, which I presume was aimed at achieving gravitas. Whether it succeeded, I will leave others to uh, speculate. What is clear is I have not changed the devolution settlement. The devolution settlement has not uh, changed. The, the settlement, uh, as achieved in 1998, was very clear in terms of the Sewell Convention, and we are abiding by that convention. Tommy Shepherd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to ask why the Secretary of State misleads members of this House and misrepresents the views of the Scottish Parliament. He must surely know that there is no objection by the Scottish Government to common arrangements. There is no attempt to have a veto. In fact, they have sought to have a partnership with a common agreed disputes procedure where differences might arise. And instead, his Government have insisted that common arrangements must make the devolved authorities subservient to the wishes of the United Kingdom Government. Given his misinterpretation of the facts, would it not be better for him to step aside and make way for someone who can better broker these discussions and seek agreement? Well, I think uh, um, we have uh, heard uh, from an expert in uh, uh, misinforming uh, the facts uh, there. That is not. That is not. That, that is not a fair or accurate interpretation of anything uh, that has happened. But in it, in it, it belies the fundamental view, Mr. Speaker, of the SNP about the United Kingdom. Scotland is not a partner of the United Kingdom. Scotland is part of the United Kingdom. Dr. Philippa Whitford. Mr. Speaker, at every stage in the EU withdrawal bill, in the second reading, we were promised that the amendments would be brought at the committee stage. Yep. Then we were promised by the Secretary of State they would be brought in the report stage. Then the third reading. We were promised when they went to the Lords, we're not just Scotland's main party, the SNP, but all Scottish MPs have no voice that there would be time to debate and amend when they came back. 19 minutes of one minister speaking. The disrespect to Scotland is visible. So what has he got to say about how he respected Scotland and protected Scotland's voice in this chamber? Yeah. Well, the, 
The Honourable Lady will know that there was a very extensive discussion about the length of time provided for uh, uh, the debate, and I uh, have said many times already that I believe it would have been better that there were more uh, time uh, available. But in, in, her, in her question, she conveniently, Mr. Speaker, misses out one word uh, that I said about the amendments. That, was, that word was agreed. I wanted to bring agreed amendments to this House, amendments that had been agreed with the Scottish Government. That didn't prove possible at any of the stages of the Bill. Sadly, it doesn't prove possible now. Deirdre Brock. Civic Scotland is also extremely concerned about this legislation. John Downey, Director of Public Affairs for the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, has said if this bill goes ahead in its current form, it will make a mockery of democracy in the UK, damage the economy and ultimately result in a constitutional crisis. Has he written them off as die-hard nationalists? Are their views to be rubbished and dismissed? Yeah. Uh. I've, uh, well, I, I, I've been listening to Mr Downey actually for nearly uh, 20 uh, years when he uh, uh, used to uh, lobby the, the, the Scottish Parliament when I was uh, a member. Of course uh, uh, we listen uh, to, the, to the views of, of anyone coming forward, but I absolutely uh, disagree uh, with that interpretation. This bill, as businesses across Scotland uh, recognise, is about bringing certainty on the day that uh, that we exit the EU. It's about ensuring uh, that people know uh, what uh, the legal position is, and that is universally welcomed by business across Scotland. Brendan O'Hara. This week, his government abandoned any pretense of a commitment to devolution by refusing to recognise and respect the sovereign will of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish people and the will of the Scottish Parliament, his government decreed that only th he will control the powers of the Scottish Parliament and they can only have what he says they can have and it will be this place that will, dis that will decide. Yet just last week his Tory colleague, the Honourable Member for Shipley, said if we allow devolved areas only to make decisions with which the Westminster Parliament agrees, there is not much point any more in any form of devolution. Ah, What's the Honourable ah. Member from Shipley right to say that? Yep. Ah. So, Speaker, again, the question is based on a premise which doesn't accept the current constitutional arrangement. Now, I respect the fact, Mr Speaker, that uh, the, the current questioner and indeed uh, the likely remaining questioners will all have that position. They are entitled to it, they are entitled to argue for independence uh, for Scotland, but they are not entitled to misconstrue the current constitutional arrangements within the United Kingdom. The Government has operated entirely within the Sewell Convention in terms of the actions that it has uh, taken. What I would say to him is, yes, I want to see the devolved parliaments doing things uh, differently doing the things uh, in Scotland that are right for Scotland. What disappoints me is how little time the Scottish Parliament at the behest of the Scottish Government actually spends legislating for Scotland and bringing forward different and new uh, arrangements that would be specific to Scotland's needs. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, during his statement, the Secretary of State repeatedly spoke about respect and he and the Prime Minister and other Ministers have repeatedly talked about their respect for the decision of the Welsh Assembly to grant consent to the Bill. If they are truly Democrats, should they not accord equal respect to the, the decision of the Scottish Parliament not to grant consent, ah. or does their respect for democracy not extend to Scotland's Parliament? Yeah. 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 Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I do respect the decision of the Scottish Parliament. I have made it very clear uh, that I am disappointed by it. I was particularly disappointed uh, by the Scottish Labour Party's uh, approach to that decision. We respect the decision, but what happens next is determined by the Sewell Convention, and we are acting in accordance with that. Patrick Grady. Yeah. Mr Speaker, he says the situation is not normal, but in fact what he is establishing is a new normal. 
He's establishing that this place can and will overwrite the Scottish Parliament whenever or if ever the Scottish Parliament chooses to disagree. That is the opposite of the Sewell Convention. Yeah, yeah. The way he can demonstrate that he is not in defiance of the Sewell Convention is by standing in the dispatch box now and confirming that the bill, the EU withdrawal bill, will not be sent for royal assent until agreement is reached. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, of course there is still time uh, to reach agreement and uh, we have indicated that if the Scottish Government came forward and uh, set out agreement to what is proposed, we would of course uh, welcome, uh, would of course welcome that. But the honourable gentleman, as a number of his colleagues have done to date, and no doubt will hear further, choose to misrepresent what the Sewell Convention says. It is not an absolute term. It hasn't uh, been. In, it hasn't been utilised uh, in this uh, way previously. I wouldn't want uh, it to be uh, utilised uh, again. I, I would want us to reach agreement with uh, the, the Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament, on issues such as these. And I give that commitment today that, on all occasions, that will be my approach and this government's approach. Uh, Stuart Malcolm Macdonald. Which of the English language can the word collaboration encompass a 19-minute statement, all of Scotland's members of Parliament excluded from that debate, and a vote then happening to override the wishes of the Scottish Parliament? But this is a poor excuse for a Parliament, and he's fast becoming a poor excuse for a Scottish State Secretary. So will he get to the dispatch box and do what my honourable friend from Glasgow North has just said? Confirm that the EU withdrawal bill will not be sent for royal consent until an agreement is reached. Mr uh, Speaker, I I'm sorry, and I am sure you will be, that the Honourable Gentleman has such a low view uh, of this uh, Parliament, because he seems to me to be a very active contributor uh, to it, and to, uh, ut to utilise his position as a, 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 as a local MP uh, effectively. Uh, I can't give him uh, the undertaking uh, that he is uh, seeking. What I, have, uh, un what I have said more than once already already uh, at the dispatch box is that if the Scottish Government come forward, uh, wish to uh, proceed on the basis that the Welsh Assembly Government are proceeding, then I am more than happy uh, to facilitate that. I am more than happy uh, to have a discussion on any other uh, constructive uh, proposal around these issues. Martin Day. Thank you. Just to just after the Brexit vote in this very chamber, the Scottish Secretary confirmed to me that the Scottish Government will be at the heart of the negotiation process. Yet here we are after the withdrawal bill debates with no sign of how the UK Government will reflect the will of the Scottish Parliament. Does he not see this as anti democratic and disrespectful? Yeah. Yeah. The Scottish, we've moved to ensure the Scottish Government are at the heart of the uh, negotiation process and a new ministerial forum has been established which my uh, honourable friend, uh, the Minister for the Cabinet uh, Office, co-chairs. That's met with Scottish Government ministers to discuss how they want us to approach certain elements of the EU negotiations. So, yes, a... Um, on, on areas where uh, the Scottish Government have uh, an input into that process. We want uh, to ensure that it is there, that it is heard, uh, and that uh, we uh, do uh, work uh, collaboratively uh, and uh, constructively. What we can't agree with is the Scottish Government's proposition that the Scottish Parliament should have a veto over measures that apply across the whole of the United Kingdom. Chris Law. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr yeah, yeah. Speaker. Uh, given that the former and highly respected editor of the Daily Record, who was instrumental in the creation of the vow for the Better Together Parties, has now decided to support independence, yeah, yeah, yeah. does the Secretary of State agree with me that the Union is well and truly stuffed and the Secretary of State's tenure is well and truly over? Yeah. Uh, Mr Murray Foote is a good friend of mine and he will stay a good friend 
Uh, I have many friends who support uh, independence, just as I have many friends who voted to, uh, that Scotland remain part uh, of uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, that is the basis on which I think this, uh, the debates in Scotland should be conducted on a much more uh, convivial, a much more civil uh, basis uh, than they have uh, recently. And the antics yesterday of the uh, Right Honourable Member for uh, uh, Ross Sky and Loch Arbour don't help uh, that because they agitate uh, the political uh, environment in Scotland. And actually, rather than enhancing the opportunity, Opportunity to debate issues, uh, they uh, reduce it. This is Marion Fellows. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with many of my honourable friends that the Secretary of State for Scotland is a nice man, and I respect him personally. But does he not see that his government's complete disdain for Scotland extends even to his position? He was sidelined during the Brexit discussions, had no place at the table to discuss the impact on Scotland. His paymasters hold him in the same contempt as they do the Scottish people. When does there come a point where principle takes over? For the Secretary of State. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I can agree, of course, Mr. Speaker, that the Honourable Lady is a nice uh, lady, and uh, I have always uh, got on uh, well with her. But uh, beyond uh, the initial part of her question, I don't uh, agree uh, with her. My uh, role is to be at uh, the heart of the government, ensuring that Scotland's issues and concerns are taken account, not just on Brexit, but on a whole uh, range uh, of other issues. I know uh, the Honourable Lady, like her colleagues, don't uh, accept the current constitutional uh, arrangements, but I will continue to do my job of standing up for Scotland within the United Kingdom. Ronnie Cowan. I'm going to be a bit more conciliatory than some of my colleagues today, and I would like to thank the Government's man in Scotland. I thank the Secretary of State for his insipid statement, and I thank the Secretary of State for failing to show respect to the Scottish Parliament, and I thank him for failing to engage in meaningful discussions with people I could not reach during the Scottish referendum are now stepping forward in their droves and engaging in this conversation. People that argued no to vote 2014 are flocking to the Indy cause. SNP membership is once again on the increase, and when the time comes, as it surely will, the Secretary of State will reap what he has sown. Is this the legacy the Secretary of State wants for his tenancy? It's, Mr Speaker, I, the, the others uh, on the SNP benches have sought perhaps to hide it a bit more. The Honourable Gentleman didn't. He's very, uh, very clear. What this is all about is having another independence yeah. referendum. And I'm afraid on that matter we are never going to agree. Chris Stevens. Speaker, it was no surprise to hear the Secretary of State a few moments ago condemn walkouts given that his party uh, legislated 30 years ago to deny workers that right in every other workplace. Yeah. But can I ask him, um, he has not mentioned in his statement anything about the views of Civic Scotland. Yeah. who have an overwhelming negative reaction, such as the STUC, as to Clause 11 in its current form. Does he not agree uh, with the STUC that in its current form, Clause 11 is devolution's greatest ever crisis? I most certainly don't agree with that assessment, and the, the feedback I have uh, from Civic Scotland and from ordinary uh, people across uh, Scotland is that they are sick and tired of this constitutional wrangling, of this dancing uh, on a head of a pin to find something to have a row about. They want the two governments to work together in the best interests of Scotland, and in particular in the current circumstances, to get the best possible deal for Scotland. Scotland and the rest of the UK as we leave the EU. Carol Monaghan. Choice, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> given, Mr. Speaker, given the assurances we've heard recently on the Northern Ireland border, will the Secretary of State commit that if, the North, if Northern Ireland gets a bespoke deal in terms of regulatory alignment? He will be fighting to protect Scotland's interests and ensure Scotland gets a similar deal. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, 
the, uh, the, my answer is actually the, the reverse in the sense that we want an arrangement that applies to the whole uh, of uh, the United Kingdom. We are not going to have bespoke arrangements for different parts. We are not having bespoke arrangements for different parts of the United Kingdom. Peter Grant. In his capacity as Scotland's man in the Cabinet, the Secretary of State has been responsible for promises being made on four occasions from the dispatch box and he's been responsible for those promises being broken on four occasions. In his capacity as the Cabinet's person in Scotland, he's been responsible for a situation that the BBC have described as can fairly be described as a power grab. The Spectator magazine have said no self-respect in Scottish Government could ever accept it. As has been mentioned, one of the most arch unionists of 2014 is now enthusiastic with pro-independence and in the last 24 hours before he stood up, 5,000 new people have joined the SNP. Mr Speaker, if that's what he does when he's trying to keep Scotland in the Union, what on earth would he be doing if he was trying to persuade us to leave? <laughs> Mr uh, Speaker, I, I do not uh, recognise the uh, Honourable Gentleman's uh, catalogue of uh, events. I have been very clear, I have been very clear uh, and I have said uh, already in answer to other questions, I wanted to bring forward amendments to the Bill to this uh, House. But I wanted to bring forward agreed amendments, amendments that had been agreed with the Scottish Government. It was not possible then, and it has not been possible now to reach that agreement because the Scottish Government have adopted a position which is not in accordance uh, with the current constitutional settlement. It is a view that the Scottish Parliament should be able to have a veto over matters that affect the whole of the United Kingdom. That was not part of the original devolution settlement and it's not part of it now. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker. Aye, aye. During Tuesday's 19 minutes and even in today's um, question, we still have heard nothing from the UK Government on how it proposes to reflect the views of the Scottish people and the views of all the democratically elected parties in the Scottish Parliament, save for the out-of-touch Tories. Does the Secretary of State think that this is an illustration of Scotland being a valued and equal partner in the Union. And why, Mr Speaker, why, Mr Speaker, does the Secretary of State continue, right through the whole um, debate today, continue to try and persuade this as a Scottish Government refusing consent when he knows fine well it is every single party in the Scottish Parliament except yeah. the Tories? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, we, we as the Honourable uh, Lady, whose, con whose energetic contributions I always enjoy, uh, uh, would, uh, affect, would, would, would make clear we have been seeking to agree an arrangement with the Scottish uh, Government. The Scottish Government then takes forward a recommendation to the Parliament in relation to legislative consent. And they took forward a motion uh, not just actually to decline uh, this, uh, these, uh, this part of the bill, but the whole, uh, the, the whole uh, bill. Uh, I would have wished that it was uh, otherwise, but I hope now that we can move forward to work with the Scottish Government on the issues that we have already agreed. We have agreed the 24 areas that it is likely that we will need common frameworks, and that is where we should be uh, just now. We should be working with the Scottish Government, Welsh Assembly Government, and hopefully uh, in time a, a, well, a Northern Ireland executive to create those frameworks, because it is those frameworks which will have the impact uh, on the day-to-day -day lives of people in Scotland. And that is what people in Scotland want to see. They want to see their government focusing on the issues that matter to them, not on uh, constitutional pinhead arguments. Gavin Newlands. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, on Burns night, the Scottish Secretary told me in this chamber uh, the Bill will be amended in agreement with the Scottish Government and the Welsh Assembly Government. He said he took full responsibility for failing then. Will he take full responsibility for going back on his word now and resign? Here, here, here. Mr Speaker, I, I, uh, the, the emphasis that the Honourable Gentleman put uh, on the words in those sentences is not quite correct because I wanted an agreement with the Scottish Government, but it is quite clear that that agreement is not going to be uh, forthcoming on a basis that would be acceptable under the existing devolution uh, settlement. And we have rehearsed uh, those arguments, Mr Speaker, numerous times uh, in answer.
answers to uh, questions today. It is not uh, acceptable that the, that the devolution settlement be changed as part of Brexit to give the Scottish Parliament a veto over matters that would apply across the whole of the United Kingdom. Alan Brown. Yay! Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. A reminder, the Tory-friendly Spectator magazine said that no self-respecting uh, self party uh, of any colour could give consent to the EU withdrawal bill in its current format. As other own members have said, much of Civic Scotland agree about the impact on devolution. And yet, instead of showing any contrition whatsoever, he comes to the dispatch box, tells us to like it or lump it, and does some SNP bashing for good measure. It's quite obvious the Secretary of State can't even differentiate between the SNP, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. True. So can I ask him to show some backbone for once and resign? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr uh, Speaker, when uh, we, br we brought forward the initial proposals, uh, members of this House, members of uh, the Scottish Parliament and others uh, responded to those proposals. I appeared before the Finance and Constitution Committee of uh, the Scottish Parliament and we listened to uh, what we heard from all uh, of those and from Civic Scotland and from uh, elected representatives right across Scotland and we made very, very significant uh, changes uh, to the Bill and as the Member uh, for Edinburgh South pointed out, we we were extremely close to reaching agreement. Those in the room uh, felt that agreement could be reached, but at the end of the day, Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish Government did not agree with what was proposed. And on that basis, uh, on that, uh, basis we have not been able uh, to conclude agreement. I regard that as regrettable. Uh, I would still uh, uh, welcome uh, the Scottish Government to come on go board with uh, the Welsh uh, Government in relation to supporting uh, the proposals, uh, if uh, that is at all possible. Alison Thewlis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My knees are now well and truly jiggered. Um, <laughs> isn't it a worrying and disturbing interpretation of consent when one institution can impose legislation yeah. on another? Could, he, could the Secretary of State tell us exactly what his definition of consent is? Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, I set out, I, I set out in my uh, statement the definitions and, and uh, operation. Uh, of the Sewell Convention. Now, I understand, I understand that the Honourable Lady doesn't support the existing constitutional arrangements in the United Kingdom and wishes to change them. And that is, as I've said at this dispatch box repeatedly, a perfectly legitimate position to adopt. But what is not right is to seek to misconstrue the existing arrangements. The Sewell Convention is clear and this Government has acted in accordance with it. Mr David Linden. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, in the 1990s, there was a referendum on devolution and every party, including my own, except the Secretary of State's party, campaigned for a yes vote. But Scotland rose to the occasion after that yes vote, including the Conservatives, and one of the proudest moments that all of us in Scotland had was watching those new MSPs for the first time process up towards the General Assembly of the Scottish Parliament. Mr Speaker, can I ask the Secretary of State, who was in that procession as a new MSP, did he ever think that 19 years on, when all those people in Scotland looked on with pride, that he would be at that dispatch box and starting the process of deconstructing the Scottish Parliament? Perhaps it, was apt to, perhaps it was apt to leave the most ludicrous contribution uh, to uh, the last. This government, this government has delivered... Uh, this, this government has delivered additional powers to the Scottish Parliament. So how the Honourable Gentleman can make that statement as Ministers today discuss the transfer of welfare powers so that the Scottish Parliament can set up its own uh, welfare system, the introduction of income tax uh, powers which regrettably some of us have now to pay more tax in Scotland than other 
parts of the United Kingdom. This Government has presided over a significant increase in the powers and responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament. But, Mr Speaker, it will never be enough for the SNP. It will never be enough because ultimately they don't support devolution and all they want is another independence referendum. Order, I'm most grateful to the Secretary of State and to colleagues.